Okay. So, uh, I was just mentioning, I think I'm the only one who has slides with a piece of cake in it. So I'm going to take the other blender, just by default. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the first thing is, uh, the title of this talk is actually ironic. Uh, because development is cool, it can be fun, but it's not always a piece of cake. Uh, writing code is usually, depending on your skill level, is either something easy and fun, or it's something complex and you're learning something new. You're outside of your comfort zone. Um, but in general, the whole process around development, so all the stuff people usually forget, is really hard. So uh, managing a team of developers, managing a company, um, managing clients, it's hard, it's difficult to do. And usually you're running uh, into areas where you're uncertain. There's moving targets, there are unknowns, there are variables. So you're always adapting to the circumstances that you're encountering. Um, so, uh, first off, just to get it out of the way, because I haven't done this yet, uh, don't think I've actually been formally introduced. Uh, so, I'm James Watts. Um, I am British, you may not have noticed. Uh, I'm from Madrid, Spain. I'm, the core, I'm a core member, but I'm also team lead at Cake DC. Uh, team lead is kind of relative because we don't really have roles at Cake DC. We're just all part of the same team, same unit. Uh, I've been in open source since 2008. Uh, projects that I work in KPHP, which have some minimal significance, uh, the Cake uh, Toolkit, and uh, recently I've been working on something called the Cake Markup Language. Uh, you can look me up on uh, GitHub for that. And I've also the author of a couple of specifications, uh, probably the most uh, known ones are Extended HTTP and the Documentation Markup Language. So first, uh, a misconception. So Cake DC is not actually in Washington DC. What? No. no, we're actually in Nevada, Vegas. So uh, yeah, if you're going to call us, don't ask me that question, because I get asked it way too much. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is more or less what I summarized before. I'm going to talk a bit about us, what we do, uh, where we fit in the community as, as a KPHP development company, and what, uh, at least I feel personally, because I'm giving a talk, uh, what sets us apart. So uh, first off, a little background. Um, we've, been, we've been running since 2007, and the company was uh, originally uh, set up by this guy. <laughs> I'm in trouble. This is Larry Masters. He's uh, one of the three founders, the original founders of KPHP. He's the only one who's actually left. The other two did not die. Uh, they're actually still around, but they kind of disengaged from the project really early on, like back in 2005. Uh, and Larry's been behind the project you know, from then on. Obviously, Larry doesn't do us on our own. We've got the awesome core guys at the back, everyone who's contributed before then. Uh, you know, everyone is relevant and the time and effort that they've put in. So the idea uh, behind Cake DC was to set up a company which allowed people to work on Cake PHP as a livelihood. Now, you've got to go back in time to 2007 and you know, put this concept into your head. Cake PHP wasn't what it is now back then. It was an up and coming framework. It's true that it got a lot of traction at the beginning, so there was a lot of interest in it. But what Larry wanted to do is he wanted to make it something where people you know, could you know, make their lives off of doing this. So you could wake up in the morning and you do KPHP. And you go to bed and you wake up the next day and you're doing KPHP. So you're doing what you love. So, and he wanted to kind of set the, uh, the common denominator amongst development companies which are doing KPHP. We've got Lotus uh, with us here uh, this year. And those guys have also been around like from really, really early on. They've been behind the framework and they're still going you know, strong with it. Um, it's this ideal that this isn't really a job, it's not really a, a professional function, it's about being a part of the open source project. So it's very much different from just being this commercial entity where you offer services, you're actually becoming a part of the ecosystem that revolves around the project itself. So a lot of the things we do uh, is engaging with the community. For example, Cakefest, we're all here now. 
Uh, all of the, most of the people from Cake DC are involved in the organization process. They're helping out at the event. You know, it's, we just consider it part of something we do. Uh, it's, we get up and we take a flight, you know, halfway across the world and we help organize it. That's just, we just do that because it's the project. Uh, so Larry's idea uh, or ideal of doing this, you know, he's really pushed it and made sure that everything we do is focused in that area. So uh, one of the things we'll, we're very well known for uh, is the Cake DC plugins. Now, some of you here may have engaged with some of our plugins. Some of you may use them. Some of you might have them in production, cross fingers. Um, and we actually had these as internal plugins until 2010, when we released all of them as open source. So we just basically said, OK, we've been using this stuff in the company. Um, it was basically. What? Most. Most, most, yeah. There are like one or two which the ground, but it's because we're embarrassed. Um, but we let them out into the community because we said, you know, well, we use this. This is good for us. And we can see how this can benefit other people in the community as well and how they can build their projects on stuff that we've, you know, built. And a lot of the core people have actually been through Cake DC. Uh, you know, people who aren't there now, they've you know, worked at Cake DC, they've worked on client projects, and they've invested a lot of time on client projects. And a significant amount of that has gone back into the community, uh, either through projects or issues on the framework itself being encountered when working on a client project. It goes back as you know, a, a fix or a patch to the framework. So uh, I mentioned we had quite a few. Uh, and some of these are pretty well known. Uh, they're pretty, uh, um, I don't know whether liked is, is the adjective, but um, they're definitely used a lot uh, in the community. Uh, we've got the users plugin, the search plugin, comments, uh, utilities, ratings, migrations, uh, templates and tags, and a lot more. You can check it out on the, on the GitHub page. Um, but there is an issue with the plugins. We fucked up pretty bad on the plugins. And that is because we jumped into open source and we said, well, we got this code. Uh, you know, we're going to let it out there into the community. But there wasn't a lot of thinking behind, you know, well, what is the repercussion of that? You know, this is a large, extensive code base when you put them all together. And you can't just throw stuff at, at the community. You've got to be responsible. Now, there are a lot of people out there, you visit their GitHub accounts, and they've got like 500 repos, and they're not forked, they're their repos. And you've got to look at that, and you've got to be serious. You're going to say, well, you know, is this guy really maintaining this stuff? You know, if, if I have a problem, if he's got 500 repos, I mean, is he really going to pay much attention to me? So we wanted to make sure you know, that if we do something, you can count on us. You can say, well, you know, Cake DC is doing it. You know, we can count on them. And one of the things that has happened in, in recent years is uh, Cake DC has become really active with client projects. And we just haven't had the time or the dedication to be able to put the effort that we really expect of ourselves into the plugins. So one of the things we've been doing recently, and uh, Florian uh, Kramer, also known as Burzum, wrote a post on our blog not long back, uh, announcing a big revision that we're going to be doing of the plugins. Uh, and basically, uh, we're saying, you know, we can make up for it. So I'm saying we screwed up, but we're going to make up for it. And the way that we're going to make up for it is uh, we set out some objectives for, for ourselves. So we wanted to identify uh, what are the problems that we find facing the maintaining of uh, KPHP plugins? And how can we uh, wrap this up into something that we can pass off to other people and say, you know, well, this is how we do it. This is successful. These are the problems we've encountered over years of developing KPHP plugins. How can our efforts be useful for you guys as well? So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, and you don't have to face you know, the adversities that we've faced already previously. So the first thing for us was defining a coherent branching strategy. Now, more or less, we follow uh, what everyone else is following. We've got a master branch, and we've got an integration branch. And then everyone else is creating features on the integration branch. Um, we've more or less decided you know, that's pretty, uh, it's the most agile model you're going to have. If you start introducing really complex uh, flows into plugin development, what you're most likely going to do is put people off actually getting involved. So your whole idea of people helping you out is you know, you're throwing it down the drain. Uh, sane versioning. How many times have you gone to a plugin on GitHub and you have no idea 
what version of the framework it's for. Uh, you've got to work out probably just looking at the directory structure, you know, is this 1.3 or is this 2.0? And in 2.0, what dependencies does it have? I mean, is there anything where it's going to, is it using something that came out in 2.3 and it's not really compatible with 2.0? 2.0 uh, and 2.1 was a, a marginal leap, so there are some things which would be um, incompatible. So we wanted to devise a versioning system where we could say, well, you know, we're going to allow you to easily target something that you know is immediately compatible with your application. Uh, documentation. If anything sucks in development in general, it's documentation. Documentation is the worst area of development. People just don't consider it a significant part of the development process. But what people forget is that when you walk away from your code, another developer comes along, or even you come along two years later, and you're going to be kicking yourself. Because you're looking at the code and you're thinking, I don't know what this does. I've got to investigate. I've got to work out what's happening here. I've got to work out when I plug this in, if I'm going to have adverse effects. All that should be documented. Edge cases, how to integrate, uh, how to implement, all of that should be covered in your documentation. So what we wanted to do is we've got a load of plugins. We wanted to normalize the documentation across the plugins so that when you go from one plugin to another, you're looking at something which is fairly similar in structure and in content. And all of this together, Basically, the objective is to increase confidence. We want there to be confidence in what we're doing with our plugins because you know, we're confident enough to work you know, with them in our client projects. We want you to come along and say, you know, well, we're going to use this. We're going to use it because it's by KDC. If we get to that point, then we've established a, a, good, a good enough level of confidence that people are just going to pick our plugins because they know they can confide in us who are doing it. So we devised. Uh, the KDC plugin standard. Um, this is kind of like a work in progress, and the objective of uh, putting all this out there this year is because we want to kind of open source what's going on in our company so that you guys can get involved. Because you guys have plugins which may do stuff or go into areas that ours don't, and you say, wait, uh, this standard is really good, but in my case, it doesn't really cover it. So you'd be able to contribute to the standard, and we'd be able to move forward and have a standard that's good for everyone. Now, this is a guideline. This isn't a rule. This certainly isn't a KPHP standard. Uh, but it's what we, we're going to be using. Uh, you know, our plugins are going to be passing over this standard. And you know, we've worked on it now for a couple of months. And you know, for us, it's going to cover our needs. So you can find this now, uh, the, the original, well, the base outline uh, on our website. Uh, it's really short. You can read it in like five minutes. Uh, and this outlines most of what I've described before. Uh, so, you know, it gives you an idea as where we're heading and what we want to do. So, the branching strategy, as I mentioned, uh, is master, which will be the latest stable version. Uh, develop, which is, remains our integration branch. Some people call it develop, some people call it development. It's not a big deal. New features uh, go into the integration branch, into develop, and uh, then we have maintenance branches. So what we've done uh, with the versioning, uh, the plugin versioning, is first of all we've adopted Semver, semantic versioning. This isn't anything new. Uh, KPHP right now follows semantic versioning, and if you see it, it's pretty straightforward what it does. What Semver does, if you go to the website, is it's put this all down in a really clear uh, specification or manifesto, however you want to call it. So it really clearly outlines how that versioning should work, how you should approach it. And what it does is it, it introduces um, consistency in what you're doing as far as development. Because it allows you to identify the part of the process that you're in by your versioning number. So it's a really good way, and you can use this internally on anything that you're doing at the company. It's going to be a way for you to say to someone, OK, well, I'm working on version uh, 1.0 or 1.0.1, uh, and they know exactly where you're at. OK? This is probably a, a lot easier as well than throwing comet hashes around. Uh, we also wanted to target the core versions. Uh, so we have plugins which we started back in the 1.3 days. Uh, I don't think there's any stuff on 1.2, although I know there is some legacy stuff kicking around. Um, and then we moved on to 2.0. And now we've got 3.0 around the corner. And 3.0 is a, a major release. There's a lot of changes which aren't going to be backwards compatible with 2.0. Um, I mean, it's still an active development. That could change, but I doubt it. 
Um, so what we wanted to do is we want to have a really sane way to say, you know, well, this version of the plugin is for this version of the framework. So what we do uh, with our versioning is we actually, our version number is the, vers the ma major and minor version of the framework forward slash the version of the plugin. So you're able to easily target a tag which you know is for your code base. Now that's really important because there are minor changes in code bases which affect how you contribute to a plugin because you'll want to engage with a feature underneath in the core, and you need to know that if you're going to do that, you're going to target it, and it's going to be there. And uh, as I mentioned, you uh, hook up with a tag, tag all the things. A lot of people aren't tagging. They just have a master or develop branch, or some, of, some people I've seen, they have like version branches. Tag it. Tagging is a really great way to say, you know, well, this, this is version X or this is version Y, or this is good to work with version AB. It's a really good way to be specific. It's a really great way that when someone has a problem, they can easily say, well, I had a pro problem with this version. It allows you to really quickly identify where the problem is likely going to be. And then regarding documentation, I mean, this is, this is just straightforward. It's straightforward, but people still don't do it. I mean, this is really easy stuff. We want to cover a description of the plugin, uh, have a really clear list of requirements, uh, requirements including dependencies, if, if some plugins have them, uh, installation instructions, if they become more complex than usual, uh, configuration options and configuration instructions if they're needed, uh, implementation specifics, which really should be just a really clear list of examples, and uh, support, license, and copyright. Uh, sometimes, I don't know if you guys have pretty popular plugins, sometimes you get people contacting you and say, I have a commercial application, can I use this? If you have that in your readme, you might avoid all those people contacting you. So what about projects? Because this is plugins, and a plugin isn't a client project. So what about projects? Well, we had problems that we needed to solve internally that we had for quite some time at Cake DC. And we needed a really um, straightforward approach that would mitigate these problems. Uh, so the first one is project management. So this is what I said at the beginning. You know, around the development process, people usually forget about this. But a lot of time goes into requirements, into revision, into discussions with the client, into maybe detailing a specification or revising a specification. All this time does add up. And if you're managing a company or if you're working on your own as a freelancer, if you're keeping a good tab of the time you're investing on this stuff, it's significant. And sometimes the client isn't really cool about, playing it, about paying it. So uh, you can either hide it in your development or you can be upfront and say, you know, well, I have this process which is going to help me reduce the cost, but you, know, you need to pay for this because you know, I'm doing it for you. Also, if you're running a company or you're working in a team of developers, this becomes a problem. The, the communication aspect of working in a remote company, for example, at KDC, is really, really crazy. I mean, we have people working from Brazil all the way to Hong Kong. So we have all our communication over Skype at KDC, uh, and we have crisscrossing time zones all across. I mean, there's almost always someone in Skype. So sometimes I come on in the morning and someone's saying goodnight. I mean, it's really, really weird. Um, and it's also a problem. Because if I'm waking up and someone's going to sleep, and when I go to sleep, someone else wakes up, if I don't catch them before they go to sleep, I can lose a whole day. 24 hours can just disappear. And you don't realize it because you're only thinking in your time zone. You know, sun's coming up, sun's going down, but that guy's somewhere else. So the uh, communication aspect of things, we try to mitigate in, by offering different channels. Uh, so, for example, at KDC, we have the immediate channel, which for us is Skype. Uh, we choose Skype, uh, well, before NSA, you know, we're, we're kind of revising whether we want to carry on using Skype, but, um, but we use Skype mostly for the logs. The logs are really good in Skype, so you can go through the history, you can see what people spoke about, you can quote what someone said. Uh, you know, it's just a really good tool, and it's quite reliable. And the good thing is, is after Microsoft took it, it didn't get too bad, so, uh, you know, it's still a good tool. Uh, then we have uh, tickets, so all of our process internally with projects is milestone driven, and then each, each milestone we have tickets, and then someone is assigned to a ticket, 
And then on the tickets, uh, we're using, currently using Redmine, uh, you can leave comments. So that's our second channel of communication. Uh, and then the third channel of communication is the one that no one reads, which is email. Uh, and then if you pop out an email, you know you're going to get a response in a week. So we try to level it out by giving people different channels, and then they can choose, you know, well, what is the priority of what I want to say to someone? Or, you know, how soon do I need information? Uh, quality and testing. Um, it's unfortunate that people don't take this as seriously as they probably should do. Uh, and this goes beyond unit testing. Uh, there are actually a lot of things that you can't unit test. You know, does a button align to the left? You can't unit test that. Does something look good? Does it meet the client's requirements as far as design? You can't unit test that. You need to have testing which goes beyond the logical and functional aspect of your application. And it's really good if you have a process which actually includes that. So it's actually contemplating the fact that you're going to be revising the quality of what it is you're actually building. And then there's staging and review. So this is, this is the part where some people get wobbly legs, you know, because the client's suddenly going to see something. Maybe you've been locked away for three months, and you're going to go show them a demo or something. Uh, this is usually a risky process, because everyone here knows what it's like. You go up to a client, and you're going to show them something, and you're thinking, is something going to break? Is something not going to work? Am I going to get a notice on a page? Am I going to click a button, and nothing's going to happen? So the quality and testing is the pre-pass to staging and review. It's what's going to give you that security to go up to the client and say, I'm going to show you something awesome. I'm going to show you more than what you expected. So we, we devised something called the Cake DC Git workflow. So just to give you an idea of what we've do, been doing before this, uh, we've been using something called Git flow. Uh, which is by a guy called uh, Dressen. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, it's a really good model. It's nothing really out there. It's nothing really you know, mind-boggling. You know, oh, this is going to change development forever. But what he did is he put it down, and he said, you know, well, this is the process from beginning to end. And he did it really, really clearly. You know, he had little images. He was showing swim lanes, you know, the process that you go through when you get to each stage, how you should handle things. So he's really clear, and he's really concise. And we've been using it. And if you're familiar with it, there are certain uh, problems that we needed to work around. And the first one was staging. The Git flow doesn't contemplate staging. So when you create a, pr uh, a project, you basically have a development branch, so your integration branch. And then from there, you branch off version branches. So you can say, well, we're going to start working on version 1. We're going to work on it, and then we'll probably test it, and then we'll probably get it to a stable state, and then we'll release it. The problem with that is there's no clear definition as to where each phase of that starts and where each phase of that ends. It's just a version branch. Who knows when, when stuff happens? So we've released this, um, same as before. We want to kind of open source you know, our internals and how we're doing stuff, and we want to share this with everyone here, everyone watching, and everyone in the KPHP community. And we want to work on this. Okay, back on? Yeah. Okay, great. That was actually planned. So we've released this also uh, through the site, uh, kdc.com forward slash git dash workflow. Um, here we basically outline how the workflow works. Uh, we give some ideas around each phase in the process. But we've also documented. So there's actually a specification. There's a PDF file that you can download, which explains everything in detail how each stage should work. It actually gives you the git commands to pass through each stage. Um, and the key features are some that I've mentioned. So we do milestone-driven development. 
Um, so there are a lot of companies, a lot of enterprise companies, which work with uh, mile-driven de uh, milestone-driven uh, development. Uh, it's basically the idea of having uh, large iterations uh, which basically contain features. So this is quite uh, different to agile development, which is basically you just have a pool of features and you're just going through features. Uh, but milestone driven development, we find, keeps things a lot well, better contained. And also from a client perspective, a client doesn't really understand features. They don't understand that if you're doing one thing, it may need to integrate with another. If you're doing another thing, it may depend on another. So clients don't understand that. As far as they're concerned, if you do one thing, it's totally isolated. And usually that is never the case. So what we do is we work in the Git flow, uh, in our flow, with uh, permanent and temporary branches. Uh, so I'm going to give them, this is all going to be cleared up in a bit. Uh, that allows us to have uh, defined branches which we know are always going to maintain a state. So we know the log of those branches is always going to show a consistent history. There is no, there's no start point, there's no end point other than the absolute start and the absolute end. Also in our process, we've actually integrated QA and testing. So as I mentioned with Gitflow, where it doesn't actually specify where that occurs, it's not very clear, we actually have it built as part of phases of the process itself. And also, uh, the cool thing about this is you can do multifaceted deployment. So you can have different things deployed to different servers. So you could have your uh, master branch deployed to a server which is emulating your live site. You've got your stage branch, you've got your QA branch, and you've got your bleeding edge, which would be your uh, develop branch. So that allows different people involved at different stages of the process to look at a certain context of the application. So this is the workflow. Uh, you may not see this really clearly, I'm going to break it down now, uh, but on the site and in the PDF you can download, it's actually detailed, you know, one after the other. Uh, but basically it breaks down like this. Uh, the development process is based off of a permanent branch and, a, and temporary branches. So here the, uh, circu the circles are our permanent branches and the diamonds are our, our temporary branches. So people branch off of the develop branch and they keep feature branches. Now everyone's, everyone's probably clear with this because this is how it goes with everything. You create your feature off of develop, you do your feature and you go back into develop. So the problem we had with Git flow is that develop is the branch. It's the development branch. The thing is that this is highly unstable. I don't know if what's in there is good. I know a guy did a ticket. I know he completed the process, but I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it meets the client's expectations. So we then have another uh, temporary branch, another um, permanent branch, which also branches off temporary branches. So develop goes to a QA branch. So this is where the milestone iteration comes in. So when someone starts a milestone, they're working on the develop branch. They're working on their features. You probably have 10 tickets in a milestone. Those would be 10 features. They complete the 10 features, so it comes to a point when whoever's in charge of the iterations of the, the project is going to say, OK, milestone one has finished. When that happens, develop is merged into QA. Now, what's the cool thing about this? I merge into QA, but I never merge back. So once I go to QA, I finished the development of the first milestone, which allows me to continue in parallel with the second milestone. So I can continue development while the first milestone is in QA. So this is really good if, you, if you've got a big push. Usually clients want everything yesterday. So you can be working already on the second milestone while the first milestone is going through QA. On QA, instead of feature branches, so QA is going to pick up problems. There's always bugs. Uh, when they pick one up, we create issue branches. So the issue branches come off of your QA branch, whoever's working on it. It could be a dedicated QA developer. It could be a developer who's just working on QA you know, in, in that project. They fix it, and they push it back. And there comes a point when QA says, OK, testing and quality assurance for milestone one is complete. So this is the point when we start to get guarantees. This is when we start to sleep better. Because we know that it's gone through a process where someone dedicated to testing whatever's been developed has said, this is good. They've given their stamp of approval. Doesn't mean it's fine, but they've said it's good enough based upon the requirements and the outline that we had to begin with. So this is where QA 
goes to another permanent branch called stage, and it gets tagged. So this is where you actually tag the milestone. This is your reference point. This is when a client says, oh, you messed everything up, you screwed everything up. Wait a minute. We can switch back to a past milestone, and we'll see if that was there. And also, QA goes back into develop, so we can feed back into develop our stable code base. So the code base which has been checked, which has been you know, assured to us that this is how the client expected it to be. We then come to release. So the cool thing about milestone-driven development is a milestone isn't necessarily a version. So if you complete a milestone, it doesn't mean you're on version two of the application, because a version can actually be comprised of multiple milestones. So what this allows you to do is you've got something in production, maybe you've got version 1.2 in production, and then you're going to come up to a point where you say, well, you know, we've got another version coming up. You know, does, is everything in there? No. Well, let's get another milestone in. So it allows you to iterate your development process, but you don't necessarily affect the release and the versioning of the application. Uh, so when you release, you basically go from stage to master. And when you go to master, you tag. Now, this is where you tag, and your versioning can be whatever it wants. You know, like I mentioned with the plugins, uh, semantic versioning is our preference. Um, but you can choose whatever you want. And basically, that's a release tag. But things go wrong. QA doesn't catch everything. QA there is a safety net, but it doesn't get absolutely everything. And sometimes it's not your fault. And you probably tell yourself, it's never my fault. <laughs> but sometimes it's not your fault. The client just had an idea in his head about his project, about the functionality of his application, and he just wasn't clear with it. You know, he didn't cover the edge cases. And maybe he didn't want you to rise his specification. He said, you know, this is fine. So you went ahead and you did something, and then you get data inconsistency, because there was just stuff that he left out. So this is where hotfixes come in. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the idea of hotfixes because their hotfixes is basically just a feature, stuff it in development, and send it over to master. But hotfixes really should be controlled because it's when you're fixing stuff which is going to directly affect something that's in production. So you'd have, you should have a really clear, really controlled process around this. Uh, and just to be clear, Git flow does. So we're not ripping on them at all for that. Uh, so when you take a hotfix, same again, you've got a permanent branch on master. Uh, you branch off to hotfix where you have a temporary branch. You fix whatever it is, and then it comes back into master, and then you tag. Now, here we're using semantic versioning. So where this would be a patch, you actually just increment the last uh, number of the version number. And then you need to merge back. So this is actually the nasty place, because a lot of people don't actually realize how complex this is. And it's really a problem because Git flow doesn't give you an idea as to how problematic this can be. So let's, let's put this into perspective. You've got something that's in production. You've got something that's running. But you've actually been in development for about two months. And it just so happens the client came to you and said, well, we've got some really game-changing features. We're going to switch it all up, and we're going to change all this and change all that. And they've changed a lot of things in the code base. So there are a lot of things that can happen. First of all, the problem which is in production doesn't exist anymore because they changed it up so much that what was actually problematic was actually removed, or it was overridden in a way that it's no longer relevant. The other problem you can have is that the functionality was changed, but it was changed in a way that the problem is actually somewhere else. So you've, you've changed up the code. The problem was you, you had a, a login issue where someone logged in, and maybe they had to have some sort of token. They no longer have the token. But the process of tokenizing changed. So where you had a problem with a token, you need now to look at, well, you know, is the new tokening system also failing? So this is actually a probably the worst part of the process. This is where the most work is actually going to go in, because you need to go back and you need to look at, OK, well, whatever I did in the hotfix, I need to look at each branch, each phase of the process, and see how I need to change this. Now, this isn't something that we introduce in this is workflow. This is in Gitflow right now. And the problem with it is you don't actually realize until you've got something in production, which is what's happened to us. We've realized, oh my god, you know, our workflow doesn't cater for this. So one of the things we've done in the document is we've actually uh, laid out three common scenarios of how you can approach the patching process. OK? Questions? I've gone over time, so I have no go. So you're <coughs> 
process all over again? Or That's in the, the three scenarios that oh. we give. Because the thing is, we wanted this to adapt to you guys. So we've got our process, but we want to leave it ambiguous so that you guys, if you've got your process, because some people don't have a QA, or some people are working on their own. They're a freelancer. So QA from, for them is taking time to do QA when they're not developing or when they're supposed to be with their wife and their wife is pissed off. <laughs> so do you need to have the QA end stage? Or like you were saying, if you're a smaller shop and you don't need to have two different stages, can you combine your QA uh, and stage stages? And also a second question, does this require all the same setup scripts that get for that? Well, uh, I'll answer the second question first. We're actually working on a script now. Uh, so I've got it sort of half done. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to open source it uh, as soon as it's good for us. And then we're going to let all you guys, you know, pick at it, find where the problems may be, or adjust it, or augment it, so, you know, so it's good for you. Uh, the first part of the question was about uh, QA. So the first thing is, is the issue with the question. Because it kind of... Uh, you're taking away the importance of QA. Now, I understand. I've been a developer. I've worked on my own. You know, I've been out there finding my own clients. QA is difficult to sell. It's really difficult to sell because the client's expecting you to do it right first time. You're saying, what are you doing QA? You're going to test your own code? I thought you write good code. You've lost a client. So uh, selling the idea of QA is really difficult to do. But it really is a good idea, especially for at least it's just unit testing, is to make sure that you're testing everything. Now, if you can't do it, sometimes there are projects where they say, you know, we'll, we'll put 10, 10 grand down if you can do it for tomorrow. And you're like, well, yeah, if I do all night, I can do it. You can just skip through the process. So you just go to QA, you don't do anything, and then you just go to stage. Okay? One of the important things that we actually outline uh, in, the, in the document is it's really easy to see something on, on the stage server and say, yeah, I can fix that quickly. I'll just go in the stage branch. I'll just commit something. I'll commit a change. You've got to avoid doing that. It's so easy to do. You have no idea. And I have screwed my teammates up so many times doing it myself. And I actually have to stop myself from doing it. It's easy to do, but the problems it can cause down the line are a lot worse because you start to get inconsistency in the branches. And you'll know because you'll start getting weird merge conflicts where you're saying, where the hell did that come from? OK, so this is to do with stability. So the uh, develop branch is considered bleeding edge. So this is your highly unstable branch. I mean, this is pre-alpha stuff. People are developing stuff. You may have the best developers in the world, but we screw up. You know, human error. We don't have the right requirements. We have incorrect requirements. We didn't realize it. Uh, so things go wrong. You need to be able to trust the code you're looking at. So when something goes from develop to QA, the process is actually changing. It's, it's like me, it, I'm saying something through the Git workflow. I'm saying, this is done. As far as development is concerned, this is done. And the same happens on QA. When QA gives it the stamp of approval and it goes to stage, they're saying something through the workflow. They're saying, we give you a certain amount of guarantee that this is good code. So it's all about stability. Anyone else? No compromising questions? Okay, we're good then. Thank you.